So far we've seen how models, views, and controllers work together, and we've even added some custom methods to our models. Now we're going to see how the built-in functionality of our models allows us to easily manipulate items in the database. Now we've learned a little bit about models, for instance how each model represents a row in a table, and how the objects have attributes matching those of the columns in the table. Now we're going to look more in depth into the capabilities of active record models by manipulating them in the console. So here I have two terminal windows open. So first I'm going to start up a console by typing Rails C. And in this terminal I'm going to be tailing the development.log file. This will allow us to see the SQL queries as they're being executed, as well as any other information. So to do that, I'm just going to type tail dash f to follow the end of the log. And then I'm going to type in log slash development dot log. Now here you can see the end of our log and I'm just going to hit command K to clear it out. So we only see new things and I'm going to just clear this out to make room for our code. So the first thing we can do is just get the project class and we can see that it's actually looking up in the database for information about the project table. That way we can see there's an ID, a name, description, priority, a due date time, created at, updated at. It gets all these columns by querying the database itself. So if we were to add new columns, there would be new fields automatically available to us in the code. I'm just going to clear this out. So one of the most interesting things we can do is call the dot all method on our project. So we just type project dot all. And what this will do is it'll query the database for all of our projects and return an array of them. So we hit enter and we can see up here we get an array of several project objects. In fact, all of them in the database. So first you can see that it loaded the information about the class and then it did another query where it selected projects.star from projects. So it's pulling all of the projects out of the database. Now there's another couple methods we could use. For instance, project.first. And this will just return a single project based on the entire collection of projects in the database. So for instance, you can see that it's not ordering it by anything. So the natural order of the database will be what is going to be determining what's the first. Similarly, we can do projects.last and get the last object. And here you can see it's actually ordering by project ID descending and grabbing the limit one. Now if we want to get a specific record out of the database and we know it's project ID, we can use the find method. So we type in project dot find and we pass a number like project number one. And so here we can see we get back the project with ID number one. So this primary key is important because we can use it with the find method to pull out a single specific object. Now if we try to pull out by an ID that does not exist in the database, we're going to get an error. You can see it's still querying for it, but what we get right here is a stack trace because we got an active record, record not found error. Now when this happens in the controller, the controller actually catches this error and will return a 404 page in production mode. We can actually refine our queries by chaining different methods onto our project class. So for instance, we can use the where method and the where method will take all of our projects and slim it down to where the inner condition here matches. So in this case, we're saying we want only the projects where the priority is equal to one. Here we're passing a hash to signify that we want only priorities equal to one. So when we hit enter, we get an array of all of our projects with the priority one. And down here, you can see that the query that it generated was select projects from projects where project.priority equals one. Now let's say we have a variable called minimum priority. And let's say we want to query only projects where the priority is greater than or equal to that minimum priority. Well, we can pass a string to the where method with a piece of SQL like this. Priority is greater than or equal to min priority. Now this will work just fine. And you can see that it creates the proper SQL code. But this can be really dangerous. For instance, if min priority came from user data, like the query string or something in the database, the min priority would be susceptible to a SQL injection attack, meaning that if somebody maliciously created a string here, they could escape it and run any arbitrary query on our database. So we want to do this in a more safe way. Unfortunately, there's a very easy syntax for doing that. What we can instead do is pass a string priority is greater than equal to and use a question mark. 
and the question mark will be replaced by any variables passed to the where method. So for instance, min priority will replace this question mark properly escaped. We can have multiple question marks and pass more arguments to the where condition to add multiple variables into a query string. So in this case, when we hit enter, it replaces the question mark with the two properly escaped. So anytime you want to have a variable in a more complex query string like this, make sure to always use the question mark. That way your variables will be properly escaped before being executed in the database. Now we can also order our queries by using the order method. For instance, here we're using the order by priority ascending clause. So you can see our query now has an order by priority ascending. Similarly, we can use a descending and it'll work just the same. Now we can chain these methods together by doing something like project.where priority is greater than or equal to min priority and then do order and just say priority. And we can see that we both included a where clause and an order by clause. So we can combine our where and order by clauses to create almost any query that we want to. So now we've seen different ways to query data out of the database. In the next part, we're going to look at how to insert items and edit existing items.